Hello friends, welcome back. It's been a while, hasn't it? I hope you all had a wonderful new year. I hope my mic sounds good. I've got a new mic and I've got it plugged in today on my computer for the first time ever. So um, let's see how this goes. Can I just say thank you so much for your patience waiting for me to come back and put out a new video it's been several weeks now as you can tell it's been a while and because it's been so long since my last video I've spent so much time collating so much information friends just so I'm on top of things and I can share what I discover with you and to make sure we're all in the loop of what's going on in terms of Bible prophecy there's going to be several things I want us to talk about today in relation to the scriptures found in Ezekiel 38. Before we go there, let me just get through one, two, three, four, five pieces of articles that I want to share with you that I think are very important. Now, if I need to, I'm going to mute the mic if I want to clear my throat. So <laughs> we shall see how that goes. I'm very excited to use this gadget, I tell you. Now, the reason why I'm focusing on Turkey, like I said in my last video, where I spoke to you about normalizations of uh, relationships between Saudi Arabia, Israel, Turkey. And I said I was going to focus a lot more on Turkey in my next message. So today, we're going to be talking about why is Turkey significant regarding the end times. I think I'm whispering, I don't know why. It's probably because it's almost midnight while I'm recording this video. <laughs> it's taken me that long. Now, this article here from the Turkish media outlet was covering a few things that Erdogan had said recently. As the title shows, Erdogan vows to advance Turkey and he relays concern over anti-Muslim rhetoric. Some time ago, you may recall, I spoke to you about the blasphemy laws being introduced at the United Nations as something to be considered as an application across the board. Along with that is the um, Islamophobia laws. And I believe Pakistan, at the time it was Imran Khan, the former Prime Minister, was the one who had a date recognised, Islamophobia Day. It's on par with anti-Semitism laws. So this is where things are moving and I've been talking about this for a long time now. Expect to see more of this happen before the beast forms. The Beast of Revelation chapter 13, but also mentioned in the book of Daniel. And I would also say this other facet of this diamond, which is Bible prophecy, is revealed to us in the book of Ezekiel. Anyway, let me get on with this article. In an exclusive interview with TRT, the Turkish president answers questions on domestic and global issues. His policies on everything from the economy to the election process as well as Turkey's energy outlook. Let me scroll down a little bit here. He's obviously making a statement regarding the upcoming elections in terms of the opposition. Quote, there are no legal obstacles in way of my candidacy for the 2023 elections. It is in accordance with the law and the constitution and the opposition's block statements claiming I can't run for elections, attempt to muddy the waters, he said. Hmm. Notice this paragraph here. <clears throat> the Turkish century 2023, marking 100 years, I'll come to explain that some more, even though I've spoken about that many times, the Turkish century is the name of the period when Turkey will be one of the most prominent countries in the world with the power and experience it has gained in the last period, he said. Erdogan underlined that the presidential system has made Turkey a more stable country 
and said that Turkey should not go back to the unstable days of coalition years. Our nation has seen what we've done in the past two decades. We aim to be a global power and it is what our people want, he said. We've heard a lot about this in the past couple of years, about 2023, the rise of an empire. Now, funnily enough, this actual website is real estate. Turkish real estate website but there's this snippet written here a blog giving a sales pitch as to why the world should invest in Turkey about a century ago our world witnessed a grinding war that not only were the victims of human beings as countries and empires went into effect and the features of countries and demographics of entire peoples changed after the battles of the First World War ended at the end of the second decade of the 20th century in 1918 AD, the Allied countries met, which are the victorious party in that war, divided the spoils and imposed their conditions on the countries that suffered the tragic losses headed by the Ottoman Empire. That great empire that once reached its borders in Central Europe and ruled the entire world for hundreds of years. And it goes on to say, One of the worst things that happened to the Ottoman Empire after the loss of the First World War was the signing of the Treaty of Loss, which is known as the Treaty of Lausanne on July the 24th, 1923 between Turkey on one hand and the victorious allies in World War I on the other and according to which the Ottoman Empire was dissolved and its borders were limited to the Anatolia region or what we now know today as the Turkish Republic. The treaty has several provisions but the worst was the confiscation of all the money of the Ottoman Empire relinquishing its rights in Sudan, which is why Turkey now has a heavy military presence in Sudan, or let's say the Suakin Islands. I've spoken about that before in my previous messages. The Suakin Islands, let me just show you a map. There were so many things I wanted to share with you, and I had to narrow my message down somewhat because it's only so much we can absorb in one sitting. The Swakin Island is a lovely, beautiful island, a little port city on the coast of Sudan. Now, Turkey has leased this island. The island town of Swakin in northeastern Sudan was an important port for trade and culture on the East African coast for centuries. The town is located on a flat oval shaped island on the west coast of the Red Sea. What's across that water? Saudi Arabia. And there's some interesting architectural photographs here. Now, Turkey has leased this island for 100 years from Sudan. And it's building up a military presence. There's that island right there. Okay, now going back to the article... That's talking about 2023. What's the significance? It's a century since the signing of that treaty, the Lausanne Treaty. 100 years, a century. Relinquishing its rights in Sudan and Egypt and relinquishing its sovereignty over Cyprus, Libya, Egypt, Iraq and the Levant. Notice Libya also is implicated in relations with Turkey because of the gas deals that they're working on right now and it's currently underway. Not a coincidence, is it, friends? If you're familiar with Ezekiel 38, I'm just going to go there now because you're wondering, where am I going with this? Well, because there's so many details, there's a lot of information in order to build this picture. We're basing all of this, all this presentation I'm giving you today is about Ezekiel 38. We are now, we are now able to better understand, I think, at least now, 
what the scriptures are referring to in particular of these lands. Because we know that Ezekiel 38, in particular chapter 38, I like to say 38 and 39, is a prophetic chapter in the Bible that describes a future invasion of Israel by a coalition of nations led by a leader known as Gog. He's a ruler over Meshech and Tubal. But this, just talking about this prophetic scripture, friends, has led to so much speculation about the identity of Gog with so many scholars and commentators linking it to Russia. And it's not true. We're going to delve deeper into that today. So buckle up. I'm jumping ahead. Hold on. So basically, we are seeing the rise, the formation of an empire, the Ottoman Empire, that received a deadly wound, oh yes, and became the sick man of Europe, which is now aspiring to revive. I like to say the deadly head wound is being healed. Okay, stay with me. The period of validity of this treaty has been set at a hundred years from the moment it was signed which falls in the next 2023 this was obviously published a year ago perhaps some things have been clarified so far about the importance of this date for turkey turkey 2023 the birth of a modern and powerful turkey we all heard and saw the huge advertising campaign launched by the Turkish AK party which is headed by Erdogan the current president of the Republic of Turkey which carried out the slogan of Turkey 23 2023 which was the basis of the electoral program of the party and president Erdogan so this history must have become a question mark for many as many wonders what this year holds for Turkey and even for the world as a whole as a whole we have previously explained in the article that it is exp expiration date of the Treaty of Lausanne, but the importance of the year 2023 does not depend on this matter only, but rather it involves many more and more comprehensive aspects of everything that matters to the country. And it goes on to list all its achievements. I'm not going to read the whole thing <clears throat> because I'm thinking I've got tons of more tabs to get through. But you get my point. It's the very um, crucial moment in the history of Turkey this year in particular. In July, this summer, marking this 100th century of the ending of the Treaty of Lausanne or the, um, the democracy of Turkey, 100 years, right? We also do not forget that with the conclusion of the Treaty of Lausanne, a new sector will appear on the Turkish scene, which is the energy sector, as Turkey will seek to explore its energy resources, which can upset the international economic balance completely, especially as natural gas resources value in the eastern Mediterranean alone is believed to reach about $3 trillion. And then it goes on to can, um, explain why it's, now's the time to invest in this country. Moving on, that took a while to just get that far, friends. <sighs> Recently reported, Turkey vows to do its part to make economic cooperation organisation more effective. Remember I spoke to you about this 10 nation, and they're all Islamic nations, confederation. It's based on economy, cooperation, right? Well, they had a get together recently turkey will continue to do its part to make the eco economic cooperation organization more effective the foreign minister of turkey said on tuesday turkey will continue to do its part to make the eco more effective and attain its true share in the world economy we know that this is an ambition ambitious goal I, when I first came across this organization, I believe that it is very significant, very interesting that there are 10 Islamic nations, right? And they're all united under this banner, Economic Cooperation Organization. And is it possibly 
a candidate for the beast because you've got the ten kings there, the ten nation leaders. But we'll have to wait and see whether it's this outfit, friends, or this other outfit that I'm also going to talk to you about today, which is called the Organization of Turkic States. Let me read this paragraph. We should continue our efforts in 2023 to turn the ECO into a more effective and visible organization. Turning to the Turkish Republic of North Cyprus, which is among the three observers of the ECO, the foreign, foreign minister said it is in fact the most active observer in its contributions to our joint work. For the past 11 years, our Turkish Cypriot brothers participated and spoke at all high-level ECO meetings. This consolidation of Turkic peoples in this particular organization it includes Afghanistan and Pakistan as well, and Iran. It's a bit of a mixture, which is why I believe that um, is more of a fitted organization in terms of the ten horns or the ten toes of Daniel chapter 2. The iron and the clay divided kingdom, but yet they're united as one. The eco fits it a bit more closely than the Turkic organization. However, we shall wait to see. Article, another one that's focusing like this huge spotlight, you guys, is on this region right now. Let me take us to world map. You know how I like my world maps. So we're looking at this region here of the Turkic peoples. I'll have to zoom out a bit more. <clears throat> The Turkic peoples, all your stans over here, Azerbaijan, of course, with Turkey, Turkmenistan, Tajikistan, Kyrgyzstan, Uzbekistan, Kazakhstan, Afghanistan, Pakistan, Iran. We should fight. We, we'll have to wait and see what happens with the current situation between Iran and Azerbaijan and if it completely falls out into conflict. I doubt it's going to get that far because they've got the eco, remember, the organization I'm talking about. So we'll have to wait and see what happens. But we can definitely see, friends, that they are working together meticulously to pull this thing off. Earlier this month, I just read that one, Middle East on the Middle East Eye.net wrote, Middle East primed to pounce when the EU bans Russian diesel. Because you've got to think, who's going to fulfill the vacuum, this energy vacuum that's been caused right now because of the West's insistence on um, destabilizing Russia, its um, autonomy, its sovereignty, its security um, concerns, and completely demolish Russia. And not only that, I did a video some time ago where I spoke about how Bible prophecy land is very much influenced by this perceived animosity or perceived hostility or threat from Russia, which I believe has heavily influenced their, inter in their interpretation of Bible prophecy, especially Ezekiel 38, obviously. But it's all been misunderstood, friends. That's the thing. A lot of what I'm going to share with you today is basically going to be a recap of what I shared with, let me just show you that channel. I was on Brother Jericho's channel earlier this week. In fact, it was last week, nine days ago, here. He invited me on. We did a 42-minute show about Gog and Magog, the shocking truth. But my audio wasn't the best, so I'm going to have to go over a lot of what I covered in that video I still encourage you to watch it and to obviously subscribe to his channel and make sure to check out his shorts videos it's very much focused on bible prophecy with the islamic theme the islamic perspective and he's reaching a very young audience which is very good because we need to encourage that and he's also reaching the islamic audience as well so going back there's the video there, Gog and Magog, this one here. I'm basically having to go over a lot of what I mentioned in that video. I've lost my place now, hold on, bear with me. Oh, 
Okay. The Middle East is set to deepen its foothold in Europe's energy market when a ban on Russian diesel and petroleum products kicks in on the 5th of February, around the corner. Bolstered by new refineries, favourable geography and potentially additional shipments of Russian product. It's going east, friends, the focus. Gulf states <clears throat> have already traded places with Russia in the crude market, redirecting sales to Europe while Moscow muscles in on their traditional customers in Asia with cut rate prices. It's happening according to scripture, you see. The Lord is bringing our attention to the East. Coincidentally, the scriptures also bring our attention to the East. One moment. I'm so glad I've got the mic mute button. This meeting, the Economic Corporation Organization, earlier, a couple of days ago, is telling me, friends, <sighs> that this alliance, basically, of Gog and Magog is forming. Now, we don't know the end result. We don't know what the actual thing is going to look like. What is it going to be called? But we can see the nations, <clears throat> Magog, the chief head ruler of this region, is forming. Within the framework of his visit to Tashkent in connection with the 26th meeting of the Eco Council of Ministers, the Eco Secretary General met with Acting Minister of Foreign Affairs of the Republic of Uzbekistan. So they've got their own organisation, their own outfit. Turkey will continue to do its part to make ECA more effective. He added that member states should enhance transportation and logistics networks and make full use of instruments to enhance regional trade, such as the Economic Cooperation Organisation Trade Agreement. Iran is also in this organisation. According to the Tehran Times, Iranian Foreign Minister highlighted the issue of energy security. It suggested that the eco-region can become a model of partnership between energy producing countries and energy consuming countries. Pakistan is also included, of course. Pakistani Foreign Minister said connectivity through the development of road and rail projects, liberalisation of visa regimes and simplification of border procedures would enable the eco countries to act as a bridge and create mutual interdependencies. Basically, <clears throat> where's my map? Forming a block. Let's form a block. Let's form a landlock where we can all work cohesively together. And like I've said many times, I call this the northern block or the northern front versus the, th the southern block down here with the Arabs and including Israel. So we've got the vehicle, the potential vehicle in place now for these organizations to form their alliances. In Ezekiel 38, let's get into the scripture. As I read this, we're going to go and look at some details about location. Location, location, location. Very important. Now the word of the Lord came to me saying, Son of man, 
This is so misunderstood, isn't it, you guys? I have a whole playlist on Gog and Magog. You can check that out after I'm done with this today. Because I go into other other aspects of it also. But I want to hone in on these regions, these locations. There's something I want to share with you. <clears throat> Son of man, set your face against Gog of the land of Magog, the prince of Rosh, Meshach and Tubal, and prophesy against him. Now I said, in the English, the wording here is a problem. The prince of Rosh is a problem. Why is that? The word Rosh simply means head. Or the mountain, the summit, as in the word or the um, the terminology Rosh Hashanah, the head of the new year. In the English, it seems as though it means a actual location, and that's what's thrown so many people's interpretation of this. This is a person, an entity, that is chief prince ruler, just as. The angelic prince of Persia, the prince of Greece in Daniel. This is also a prince. This is an angelic being that is over these regions. And I would say over this particular people groups. If we go into the Hebrew and have a look at the meaning of these words and what they mean. <clears throat> We'll, let, we'll be able to get some more information. Son of man, set your face against Gog of the land of Magog. And it's repeated, the prince of Rosh, Meshach and Dubal. Gog of the land of Magog, the princely ruler of Meshach and Dubal and prophesy. So this land of Magog. If we look here. <clears throat> in fact let's go and click on there. I'm using Bible Hub as you can see. And it shows us here. Magog. Perhaps land of Gog, a son of Japheth, also his descendants and their land. And we know their descendants, where they dwelt, where they ended up. Refers to the name, to mountainous region between Cappadocia and Media. North and East Armenia, Southeast Armenia. Magog refers to mountainous region between Cappadocia and Media. Interesting. Cappadocia, where is it today? What does that say? Ancient district, Turkey. <clears throat> Cappadocia. Ancient district in East Central Anatolia, situated on the rugged plateau north of the Taurus Mountains. So, Gog of the land of Magog. In other words, the prince of this region is Turkic. This is the region. And like I said, I would add it's a people group. It's the Turkic people groups. In the center of present day Turkey. And that's what it would look like. Cappadocia. You see that? Northeast Turkey. Interesting. Not only Cappadocia, but Media. And if we look at the ancient Mede, um, Medin, Mede Empire, we can see how vast the region was. Right. We see here. Media right there. So now when we think about the location, if we combine those two maps together, Gog of Magog, a 
against Gog of the land of Magog, the prince chief head ruler of Meshach and Tubal. That is the location that the Lord is showing to us, revealing to us. Now these people groups, the Turkey people groups, it's very interesting to learn about their history. And when you look at the maps, I tell you, we learn so much when we get to see visually where they came from. People want to jump the gun and go far north and go skip over all these people groups, right? If you look at these maps here, even the Gok Turks, there was a, a civilization called the Gok Turks. Look at the map. Let's click on that one. The first Turkish civilization or empire. Look at the map. But you see, we skip over that. We go right over there to Russia. Interestingly, the Turkic peoples are a collection of diverse ethnic groups of West, Central, East and North Asia, as well as parts of Europe, who speak Turkic languages. According to historians and linguistics, the Proto-Turkic language originated in Central East Asia region, and this is the region of the land of Magog, potentially in Mongolia or Tuvar. Many vastly differing ethnic groups have throughout history become part of the Turkic peoples through language shift, acculturation, Conquest, intermixing, adoption and religious conversion. What's the religious conversion? Islam. Nevertheless, Turkic people share to varying degrees non-linguistic characteristics like cultural traits, ancestry from a common gene pool and historical experiences. Some of the most notable modern Turkic ethnic groups include the Altai people, indigenous Turkic ethnic group, peoples of Siberia, Azerbaijanis, Azerbaijanis, <clears throat> Azeris or Azerbaijani Turks are a Turkic ethnic group living mainly in northwestern Iran and the Republic of Azerbaijan. Kuvash people, my Siri is on now. Siri, go away. The Kuvash people are a Turkic ethnic group, a branch of Augurs native to an area stretching from the Volga rural region to Siberia. Kazakhs, Kyrgyz people, Turkmens, Turkish people, Tuvans, the Yugos, Uzbeks and Yakuts. Very interesting. Let me just close that. Now, the Turkic people groups, interesting, when you look at the maps and you look at the migration, how it all happened. Look at this map here on the right, for example. Check it out. The far north, we skip over this and we go, bam, Russia. But hold on a minute. What is this empire that we've never even heard anyone talk about in Bible prophecy land? The Turkic migrations were the spread of Turkic tribes and Turkic languages. What's the significance of this? Why do you think, friends, the Turkic organization or the organization of Turkic states want to unite? come together to revive their common brotherhood this is a revival of not only the ottoman empire i believe it's a lot bigger than this and reading ezekiel 38 gives us more information doesn't it it gives us information of this people group this chief prince that's going to be ruler over them and how the lord is going to orchestrate this invasion Along with these Turkic people groups is Persia, Ethiopia and Libya. We know that Ethiopia reference here is 
pointing us to today's, in modern day, because Ethiopia was a larger landmass, in modern day is Sudan. And Libya are with them. So in the future, this coalition will be huge. No wonder the scripture says they're going to cover the land like a cloud. Prepare yourself and be ready, you and all your companies that are gathered about you, and be a guard for them. After many days you will be visited. In the latter years you will come into the land of those brought back from the sword and gathered from many people on the mountains of Israel, which had long been desolate. They were brought out of the nations and that all of them dwell safely. You will ascend, coming like a storm, covering the land like a cloud, you and all your troops and many peoples with you. So this is many peoples that are going to invade. <clears throat> I won't go into all of the origin theories. But it's something worth noting. Let me just zoom out of this for a moment because it's very large. Let me come out of here a moment. The Gok Turk sounds awful similar to Gog, what is it? Gok Turks. The Gok Turk Empire were a Turkic people of ancient Central Asia. Hmm. As the main Turkic power in the region and took hold of the lucrative Silk Road trade during the 6th century. The Gokturk rulers originated from the Asina tribe, an Altaic people who lived in the northern corner of the area presently called Xinjiang. And obviously the Uyghur Chris, um, Muslims are heavily persecuted in that part of China right now, right? Turkey's turning a blind eye to it, even though it makes remarks that it's concerned and wants to work together with China. I don't think it's going to resolve I believe that these people who are being persecuted are going to be handed over as pawns. Under their leadership, the Gokturks rapidly expanded to the rule huge territory to rule huge territories in northwestern China, North Asia, and Eastern Europe, as far west as the Crimea. They were the first Turkic tribe known to use the name Turk as a political name. At their height, the Gokturks controlled a vast area stretching from Eastern Europe all the way across northern China. Massive. Their empire made contact with many cultures, including Persia, and facilitated the movement of cultural concepts from one area to another. They had their own religion, a form of shamanism centered on a celestial deity, Tengri, and Gokturk means the celestial ones or the blue ones as in the blue sky ones. Interesting, won't go any, into all of that now, but check out the region. Here's Israel, here's Turkey, and here were the Gok Turks. Look at that landmass right there. North, a multitude of peoples. Perhaps these people will all come under the banner of Gog and Magog. We'll find out, won't we, friends? We're going to see it. I believe many of us are going to be around to witness it. Everything in blue here shows lands that were historically inhabited or controlled by Turkic peoples. Yes. Is this news to you? Were you aware of this? Has anybody taught you this in your Bible prophecy um, study groups or any of the channels that you watch where the bible prophecy teachers are talking about gog and magog i i bet this is news to a lot of you right there were 12 16 great turkic empires all this stuff that we didn't know about i believe this is important for us to understand because when this consolidation of turkic peoples or the turkic states forms it's going to take the world by surprise. There's going to be some sort of revival that unites them all. And the final one there being the Ottoman Empire. The 16 great Turkic empires. <clears throat> you see where Islam came in here. 
after the Seljuk Empire. Let's look at the Seljuks. The Seljuk Empire or the Seljuk Empire was a highly medieval, culturally Turco Persian Sunni Muslim Empire founded and ruled by the Kinnik branch of Oghuz Turks. It spanned a total area of 3.9 million square kilometers from Anatolia and the Levant in the west to the Hindu Kush in the east. Remarkable. Now, the rise of the Turks. Understanding a bit more about these people groups because I'm interested in knowing why is this people groups coming to invade? There's this rivalry in the Islamic world today and we're on different um, aspects. You've got the Sunni and the Shia conflict but you also have an ethnicity issue. The Turks and the Arabs and you can say the Persians. There's a rivalry there between the ethnicities, right? And I believe this is another reason why Iran, well, the scripture says Persia, would join in this invasion with the leader who rules and leads the Turkic peoples. Persia will be in there. So will Libya. So will Sudan. And they will all come together against Israel and Arabia, Sheba and Didan. Turkey is named after the ethnic group who came to dominate the region during the medieval era, a people called the Turks. Around the 12th century, <clears throat> excuse me, Europeans were referring to the Anatolian Peninsula, which is the area between the Mediterranean and Black Seas, as the land of the Turks. I like to see somebody just tell me. That sounds an awful lot like Ezekiel 38. The land of Magog. This is the land of the Turks. The area between the Mediterranean and Black Seas. The Turks were part of a powerful military empire that unified the region under a Middle Eastern religion called Islam, playing a major role in the spread of Muslim culture, leading up to the international religious wars called the Crusades. <clears throat> People still want to talk about the Roman Empire, but they forget about the whole eventful crusades, the invasions of the Islamic armies, the conquests, then the crusades that followed. The rise of the Turks. The ancient Turks were nomadic peoples who lived near the Altai Mountains, bordering modern-day Russia, Mongolia, Kazakhstan in the 6th century. By the 8th century... Muslim forces from the Arabian Peninsula had formed a massive empire and were pushing steadily into the region. I believe Daniel 11 talks about this. The coming kings and the succession of these kings and this northern and southern war that continues on until the end of time, which I believe is still happening today. Oh, my darling friends. A lot of us have really misunderstood the scriptures, but I think that's just by by the Lord's will. The closer we get to the end times, like that analogy I use of, um, you know, a tapestry or a painting, you know, the further you are away from it, the less able you're able to make the details of the of the painting. But the closer we approach that time, we're going to be able to see the details. And I believe this is a very exciting time for Bible prophecy students. A very historic time for us in Bible prophecy as a whole. Because we're going to be able to see and better understand now these wonderful verses in our Bible coming to pass. Because now the pieces fit seamlessly. The rise of Turkic empires introduced a new power into the region based originally around their capital south of the Aral, Aral Sea. This became very important after they officially adopted Islam as their religion in the 10th century. One group in particular, the Seljuk Turks, quickly grew in power and by all means go on YouTube and watch videos on the channel Kings and Generals. They do a wonderful job of 
um, reenacting historical conquests, how empires rose and fell, and they basically they do a wonderful work of illustrating those historic moments in history. That's um, Kings and Generals channel. The Seljuk Turks quickly grew in power, establishing their own power by 1037. The Seljuk Empire first captured the major city in Baghdad and around 1071 managed to take control of the Anatolian Peninsula. The Seljuk Empire covered over a million square miles across parts of the Middle East and Central Asia and lasted until 1194 when it fell due to internal factions that formed their own empires. The Turks and Islam. You know, some, well, sometimes I'm reading these and I wonder how much of it is already mentioned in the book of Daniel. Like Daniel 7, Daniel 8. Maybe it's worth revisiting those, friends. We've got nothing to lose and we've got everything to gain by revisiting, yes. The rise of the Seljuk Empire turned out to be crucial for the Islamic world. Anatolia was not empty before the Seljuk Turks captured it. In fact, it was part of... I just lost my mouse off the table there one moment. It was part of the Byzantine Empire, the major Christian power east of Rome. When the Seljuk Turks moved in, they brought the Islamic religion as well as Persian culture, which the Turks had largely adopted after becoming part of the Muslim Empire. It was the Islamic aspect that united the cultures together, you see. They absorbed one another and Islam was the stamp of approval on all the various people groups, thus uniting them, even though there remains today rivalry between them. Thus began the contentious transition of the Anatolian region from European to Persian in terms of culture, religion, politics and identity. And there you go, friends. That is showing us how Rome was wiped out, the Roman Empire and Islam moved in. You have to create an account to finish reading it, but let's see how far I can go. As the Seljuk Empire continued to expand, reaching its height around 1092, they incorporated several smaller Muslim kingdoms. They quickly became one of the most powerful Muslim empires in the region and were tried and were tied to other Muslim empires like the Fatimids through religion. This doesn't mean that they didn't fight with these other empires. There were dozens of battles for power within the Muslim world. Read Daniel chapter 11 for more information. <laughs> I've got a map here of the ancient Persian Empire. Just look at it. Look at the vast territory there. And the word of God in Ezekiel 38 says to us that it's Persia. So look at this map. It's not just Iran. Persia will join the army of Gog. So we're looking at a vast region. You know what I'm saying. And also media. Yes, media. Because when we go back, let's go back to Ezekiel 38, Hamagog. Strong's 4031. It says, it's the mountainous region between Cappadocia and Media, okay? So, mountainous region. <clears throat> Massive. Media, did you know that media, ancient country of northwestern Iran, generally corresponding to the modern regions of Azerbaijan, Kurdistan, which isn't a state yet, that's the problem. That's why Turkey is in Syria, because he's holding back this from becoming a reality. 
but fascinating that Azerbaijan Kurdistan formed part of the media region, friends. Amazing that the word of God is telling us the chief ruler over these peoples. These peoples here. We're not talking about here. Nowhere close. It's down here. This is the focus, you guys. And the kings of the east. East from the river Euphrates, which is down here. River Euphrates. Coming out here. Into the Persian Gulf. East of the river Euphrates, we've got all these nations here. <clears throat> all going to be a part of this Turkic organization for a reason. In fact, I shared this post on my community tab on my YouTube page some months ago. There was so much I wanted to share with you at that time, but I held back because the time had to be right. Turkic states are discussing a creation of a common alphabet. Why? To unify the people. One language. To make them all one. Together. First meeting of the language commission will be held in the Kyrgyz Republic. It's already happened now. This is back in October. Turkic speaking states, anything they can do to form a unity... As a people groups, is telling me, I believe the Lord is showing us it's over this region. I'm repeating myself like crazy. Turkic speaking states have formed a commission that will oversee the creation of a common alphabet. Can you imagine creating a new alphabet just so these Turkic peoples, with all their variances, their linguistic differences, can be united as one, a bit further united, really seal the deal. The decision aims to accelerate progress towards language unity among the states. We are not far, friends. We are not far from this beast rising. That just shows us how soon it is until the Lord Jesus Christ returns. It's not that far off, is it? The formation of the commission was announced to the Organization of Turkey States, OTS, at the seminar on the common alphabet of the Turkic world, held in the Turkish city of Bursa, which that's that um, weird phenomena in the sky appeared. I shared that also on my community page. If you if you were there, you would you would have seen it. Very peculiar portal looking like thing in the sky and dedicated to the 90th anniversary of language day hmm. the seminar was chaired by this person head of the turkish language society with the participation of the head of this organization's council of elders scholars from the turkic states kazakhstan Kyrgyz Republic, Uzbekistan, Azerbaijan and Turkey provided reports on the progress of the alphabet and language history in their countries after which they noted the importance of accelerating the transition to a single alphabet. It's, I mean, it's like forming the alliance and sealing it with language. And the final aspect, the final piece of bringing this puzzle together will be them announcing the unification of the organization under the banner of Islam, which was seal it. The outcome of the seminar was the creation of the commission on the creation of a common alphabet, right? The commission will include two members from each of the official structures dealing with language policy in the Turkic states. Interesting. So a unity of this brotherhood with a common language, a new alphabet being created. Meanwhile, Turkey, Azerbaijan, threatening Armenia with war genocide, warns the Lenkin Institute. Now, what's the significance of this region for Turkey and Azerbaijan? 
Well, let's go back to the prophecy. They're gonna. It seems like this landmass, you guys, is gonna consolidate, form a block, a solid block. Obviously, after Iran and Azerbaijan sort their differences out, there seems to be a block that will form consolidation of lands. And of course, Armenia will be swallowed up. God help Armenia. Pray for them, friends. Pray for the people of Armenia. A difficult time is coming. The Lemkin Institute for Genocide Prevention in its year-end report warned that Turkey and Azerbaijan are openly threatening Armenia with war, occupation and genocide. Under the Armenian Arsak heading, the report specifically emphasised Azerbaijani attacks on Armenia, its ceasefire violation in Arsak and its most recent blockade of the Lakin Corridor, which for the past 24 days has cut Arsak off from Armenia and the rest of the world. This conflict in Russia, friends, like I said previously, is given the opportunity for Turkey and Azerbaijan to do what they want to do quickly because they've got a distraction. Russia is distracted. The article reads, Russia's war of aggression in Ukraine has emboldened Turkey and Azerbaijan to aggressively push for a land corridor. The Zangzu Corridor, linking the two countries through the Armenian province of Sinuk. They openly threatened the Armenian state with war, occupation and genocide, while several organisations, including the Lemkin Institute, have called attention to the threat of genocide from Azerbaijan and Turkey. Powerful states, as well as the European Union, NATO and other bodies, continue to offer explicit support for these regimes. Even more so now, considering the situation regarding the grain deal between Russia and Turkey, uh, Russia and Ukraine, and also the energy crisis that's facing Europe and the West. They're going to turn to the Middle East, and in particular, Central Asia, Turkey and Azerbaijan. <sighs> Humanitarian crisis is happening, basically, in Armenia. They're being landlocked, friends, cut off. Armenia and Azerbaijan stalled in negotiations over the corridor. What's with this corridor? I'm going to talk about that. This corridor, right? In the background of Azerbaijan's ongoing blockade of the only road in and out of Nagorno-Karabakh lies the fate of another critical transportation route, the would-be Zanzur Corridor. Now... What's the deal with this place, friends? What's going on? Why does Azerbaijan want to make sure this corridor goes ahead? I have spoken about this before, but I haven't brought up these documents. Pay attention. This document <clears throat> was signed in 2009. The main purpose and tasks of CCTS which is what the Organisation of Turkic States was formerly called, the Turkic Union. The main purpose and tasks are strengthening mutual confidence, friendship and good neighbourhood among the parties, maintaining peace, strengthening security and confidence in the region and the world as a whole, search for common positions on foreign policy, blah, blah, blah. Coordination of actions to combat international terrorism and separatism, extremism, trafficking in human beings, drug trafficking, so forth. <clears throat> it goes on, the list goes on, right? Encouragement of interaction of the mass media, communication of the parties in promoting, popularising, disseminating the great cultural, historical heritage of the... Turkic peoples, yes, 
discussing questions of exchange and legal information. The structure. So this is a formal document. It's called the Nakivan Agreement on the Establishment of the Cooperation Council of Turkic States. They signed this. Let me scroll down. It's already set in stone, friends. I'm scrolling down. It might be at the very end of the document. I just don't want to miss it. Now look at this. Done in the city of Nakivan on the 3rd day of October 2009 in a single original copy in the Azerbaijani, Kazakh, Kyrgyz, Turkish, English languages. The Republic of Azerbaijan signed it at the bottom. They changed the name CCTS to, in 2021. So this Gog Magog war invasion of a coalition of nations it's obviously not going to happen overnight. This is how long it's been happening in the background, in the works. Meanwhile, the majority of prophecy land are looking at Russia as a threat. When all this is going on, this is forming. And it's all under the Lord's will, friends. It's happening for a reason. Is it any wonder why the world will marvel when the beast is up? The CCTS changed its name to the Organization of Turkey States. It was announced in 2021 by Erdogan. We have decided to rename our council. From now on, it's called the Organization of Turkey States. Today we held our summit on the island of democracy and freedom which occupies an important place in the history of our country. I hope that from now on our island will be the centre of international meetings. The whole Turkic world is proud of Azerbaijan's victory over Armenia. At the beginning of the week we celebrated the first anniversary of the liberation of the Karabakh lands. On behalf of myself and my people, I congratulate all my brothers in Azerbaijan and he's praising Aliyev, who's a psychopath. The whole Turkic world is proud of Azerbaijan's victory. During the epidemic, we shared our capabilities and once again showed that we are united as a Turkic world. You see that? <clears throat> Excuse me. Our fight against the coronavirus epidemic together with Hungary, who's also now a supervisory member of the Turkic states because Hungary believes that it's got something in common with ethnicity, but it's disproven. However, I believe they're going to continue to grow solid, maybe become a permanent member, Hungary that is. Erdogan noted that in Istanbul declaration, in that noted that in the Istanbul Declaration adopted at the end of the summit, the Turkey states reaffirmed their determination to further develop political solidarity economic cooperation. <clears throat> I hope the times are near. When the sun will start rising from the east again. Thanks to the new name and structure, <clears throat> the OTS will grow, develop, strengthen and prosper more actively. I hope the time is near when the sun will begin to rise from the east again. We strive for a Turkic world that promotes peace and stability and plays a leading role in solving global problems. We have also adopted the document Turkic World Vision 2040. During the summit, a document on the vision of the Turkic World 2040 was adopted 
which outlines the prospects, the prospects for the future of the organization. <clears throat> this is the document. <clears throat> We are living in an age that requires a strategic vision to recognise and address the rapid changes worldwide and their impact on us. All right. They've got their own vision, right? <clears throat> a lot of this is repetitive. The Corporation of Council of Turkey states shortly known as Turkey Council has taken its strength from the commonalities in language, culture and shared past of our peoples. This has provided a favourable basis for the gradual institutionalisation. Oh, it's basically a Turkic EU. This course taken by the Turkic Council is now duly reflected in its new name. Okay. international peace stability prosperity so they've got a vision they want to be successfully formed consolidated by this time and these are the points this is what they promise we with this understanding we the heads of state of the organization of turkey state and it just goes on Look, I can leave this in the description if you want to read the whole thing later. But there is something in there I want to highlight. Let me just read on until I get there. <clears throat> Here we go. I had highlighted it. Transform the member states into a vigorous regional economic group linking east and west, north and south trade corridors. There's a point to this, friends. <laughs> so bear with me. I'm showing you what the goals are. This is how big the beast is going to be, right? <clears throat> I think I've got asthma issues. By the way, that's why I get like this after a while talking. Transform the member states into a vigorous regional economic grouping, group linking east and west, north and south, trade corridors, contributing to regional and global economic stability, create seamless, integrated, efficient, fast, sustainable, multimodal connectivity among the member states by simplifying and harmonising customs and transit procedures for border crossings. Liberalise the member states' transport sectors, including transit passes, to accelerate transport operations with minimum logistical costs and eradicate the non-physical barriers to efficient, stable, fast and seamless transport across the Trans-Caspian International East-West Middle Corridor. And that, my dear friends, is what this conflict is really all about. They want to squash the life source out of Armenia in order to realise this ambition. <clears throat> This is what it looks like. Do you see that? Let me zoom in. Okay. This is the future. Logistical. I mean, it's crazy. It's huge. The Trans-Caspian International Transport Route starts from Southeast Asian China runs through Kazakhstan, the Caspian Sea, 
Azerbaijan, Georgia, Georgia and further into European countries. This is going to be a regional beast. In fact, a lot of people are losing hope in that Chinese Belt and Road Initiative and thinking that this would be the one that will pull it off. Eurasia's middle corridor and Atlantis frenzy to stifle Europe, Asia integration. <clears throat> Very interesting article, I have to say, but I don't want to read the whole thing. Let's read snippets of it. On December the 12th, the US agency International Development hosted a conference on the future of Eurasia's Middle Corridor, a transport and energy infrastructure development project that stretches from the resource-rich Caspian Sea to Europe. Wow. <clears throat> the beast. Oh, Lord. You know, it's going to take the Lord Jesus to do with it when he returns. So this is how huge this thing is going to be. While everyone's looking to Russia, who's absolutely bombarded and bogged down in Ukraine and caught in a predicament in Syria with Iran and Turkey and Armenia. Meanwhile, this is all kicking off, isn't it? It's all forming. <clears throat> At the meeting, leading Atlanticist officials paid particular attention to how to frame the strategic global transportation of developing outside of their control. They emphasise that the nation standing most to gain by the inevitable growth of the Middle Corridor should not characterise themselves as an east-west regional hub connecting Europe to China, but rather as a standalone zone of wealth independent of China and supportive of a declining EU. The value of the Middle Corridor has increased significantly, significantly in the past year due to two main factors. First, the Russian military intervention in Ukraine. And second, the urgency to decarbonise in those nations still trapped within the Atlantis sphere of influence. Look at that map. Where's the focus? Um, let's just scroll back up here. I think the Lord is telling us that this huge alliance is all orchestrated by the Lord. Amen. The Lord is in control, right? You see how much in control he is. <clears throat> Let me go back to my document. Okay. I showed you the route. This, this is where he was. The Middle Corridor gets its name from China's Belt and Road Initiative, which was launched in 2013. It consists of three corridors of development designed to promote trade and inter-civilizational commerce on an east-west basis. These corridors are the Northern Corridor, the Southern Corridor and the Middle Corridor. <laughs> The Northern Corridor, currently the most developed and utilised of the three corridors, it consists of railways, pipelines that run from China to Kazakhstan, Russia and Europe. Some Atlanticist <clears throat> geopoliticians would like to see this corridor shut down to further isolate new enemy Russia's transportation and commercial routes. It's probably going to be shut down. The Southern Corridor. Less developed but still important, this corridor involves the construction of continuous rail connections from China to Pakistan, Afghanistan, Iran, Iraq, Syria, Lebanon and potentially Turkey before reaching Europe through ports in Lebanon and Syria and via land-based connections in Turkey. This route has the potential to promote sustainable peace and reconstruction in West Asian nations and could possibly be extended to integrate and industrialise the Persian Gulf states through large-scale, high-speed railway projects like the 2,000km Persian Gulf Red Sea High Speed Railway and hasten development prospects in the strategic Horn of Africa. Massive! The Middle Corridor, here we go. <clears throat> the most complicated but no less essential of these arteries is the Trans 
Caspian International Transport Route, dubbed the Middle Corridor, and features multimodal rail and sea transit of goods from China to Europe via... I was going to say, these are your land of Magog nations, excluding Armenia. Georgia could be part of it, of course. Perhaps Georgia is Goma. Although this path involves the shortest distance, complications and additional costs arise with the complex process of transitioning from land routes to sea routes via ports in the Caspian Sea. On March last year, a quadrilateral agreement was signed between Turkey, Azerbaijan, Kazakhstan and Georgia to advance the construction of the railway system and pipeline and the national gas pipeline, which is already in operation. This pipeline is part of the larger Southern Gas Corridor which involves seven countries and consists of over 3,000 kilometres of pipelines worth $35 billion. Yeah, I'm going to move on. <laughs> but China is not entirely sure about the Middle Corridor. They're not going to be the main players in this. I think they're going to be riding it as much as they can. But because the Belt and Road Initiative developments between China and Pakistan didn't get off from a good start, it's just made it look a little bit less enthusiastic, let's put it that way. Russia's war on Ukraine has been a game changer for Eurasian connectivity. The route through North Eurasia running from China to Europe that served as a major conduit between the two is now less attractive as a result of the Western sanctions imposed on Moscow. Charming. It is rare in geopolitics that so many states in such a short time frame would agree in advancing a certain project. The Middle Corridor, connecting China and Europe via Central Asia, the Caucasus and the Black Sea is a good example of a vision where different countries from across Eurasia have accelerated the work, not only on promoting the idea, but also laying the ground for its expansion. <clears throat> Turkey's pipeline politics in Central Asia. As the Kremlin's war in Ukraine stumbles on, meanwhile, Turkey is looking to take advantage by increasing its influence in the strategically important regions. I think the title said it all, basically. Central Asia's middle corridor gains traction at Russia's expense. Yes. It's going to happen, friends. Either one of these corridors, and it's probably going to be this middle corridor, Middle East, middle corridor, right location. It seems it's going to happen pretty soon. But how long? I don't know. Five years? Ten years? Sooner? That development is likely to continue receiving increased support from the EU and the US engagement from Turkey and eventually meet reluctant acceptance by Russia, China and Iran. Amazing. Another document taken from their most recent meeting the organisation of Turkic states had when they met together in November last year I've got some of the wording here and there's something I wanted to share with you from it. The theme was the new era for the Turkic civilization. I mean, do you want me to go on? Do we get the point? Do we understand where this is going, friends? So you've got this organization and ethnic people groups forming, building some form of coalition there's several outfits but they're doing it right the groundwork's been laid i would say they're beyond the groundwork and nothing's going to get in their way because if the lord 
has set this up. <laughs> it's a guarantee it's going to happen, yes? But I'm glad the Lord has allowed me to see this happening and I've been sharing it with you as we're going along, step by step. The heads of state of these Turkish states got together, underscoring their commitment to deepen and widen cooperation and solidarity in line with the purposes and principles of the Nakavan Agreement on the establishment of the Turkish states, reiterating their resolve to further deepen and widen cooperation within the multilateral framework of the Turkish states based on common history, language, culture, traditions and values of the Turkish peoples and religion. <clears throat> Acknowledging, let me read from here, stressing the importance. Oh man, where do I read it from? Expressing, let's read all of this. <laughs> Expressing satisfaction with the achievements made by the organization, Turkey State, since its establishment, emphasizing their commitment to enhance the organization's role in ensuring cooperative and coordinated action in the Turkic world and further promoting the values and interests of the Turkic world in the regional and international arena, stressing the importance of holding consultations on regional international issues affecting the interests of the Turkic world in the framework of the Turkic states. Oh, the words are just so dreary. Praising the life and works of the great personalities of the Turkic world who created the heritage of... Turkic Islamic civilization and had a huge impact on world civilization, development of science, literature, and art. Acknowledging the historical, political, social, cultural significance of the ancient city of Samarkand in the unification of the Turkic peoples and the development of the Turkic culture, science, statehood, as well as taking into account its location at the crossroads of the Great Silk Road and noting that the holding of the summit in the ancient internal city has a great symbolic meaning. After all that, they declared and signed and endorsed the organisation Turkey State Strategy for 2022-2026 to for the implementation of the Turkic World Vision. They're doing it in phases, yes. I'm going to put these in the description box. I must remember because, I mean, I find this interesting. Do you? We've got so much detail information here of what the beast is going to look like. I mean, I am speculating this whole time, of course, but with sense common sense being very careful with how I'm speculating okay this is like an intelligent speculation capital of the Turkic civilization taking into account its important role for development of Turkic civilization throughout the history being home to scientific religious spiritual figures educators Azerbaijan, praised in here, Kyrgyzstan, <clears throat> Turkmenistan, Hungary. Appreciate Hungary's active cooperation and coordination with the Turkic states as an observer state, as well as its increasing emphasis on enhancing its relations with all Turkic states. Very suspicious. Underline their support for an inclusive represent- representative political system which upholds fundamental Human rights in Afghanistan. Hmm. Scroll down some more. Decide to enhance their cooperation in fighting against all kinds and forms of terrorism, extremism, xenophobia, hatred against Islam, hate speech, disinformation. They'll have their own disinformation um, offices also. I think I covered that in another video. Anyway, it goes on, it goes on. <clears throat> it's 
sometimes I take a lot of time reading these things and I'll go back and forth in the scriptures to like, Lord, am I sure? So when we go back and now we look at these empires that are relative to Bible prophecy, the Babylonian, the Medo-Persian, the Greek, right? The head of gold. This, um, this image here from Daniel 2, the Babylonian, the Medo-Persian, the Greek empire. Can we honestly say now that it's never going to be the Roman Empire? It's most likely an Islamic beast. Most likely. Probably. <sighs> Look at the boundaries one more time. I mean, you guys. <sighs> the Lord, in so many ways, is trying to tell us where to look. The Medo-Persian Empire. I'm sorry, it's got nothing to do with Russia or Europe. The Greek Empire. The map I had after this was to show you the beast that came, that took over. The Islamic Empire. For those of you who want to say still Rome, well then how about you consider it the eastern leg of the Roman Empire, which was all in the Middle East. The Byzantine Empire. That was conquered by the Islamic armies that came. Map of the Ottoman Empire also. I mean the boundaries, just look, the landmass, the region, friends. So much I've not shared with you because a lot of it on my left side here on the screen are all news tabs. Or geopolitical news that I want to save for another day. I mean, it's important, but not as important as this. Really, we're, we're really zooming in. You know how you zoom in on the map. We're really zooming in on this location to understand this is the location Ezekiel 38 is talking about. Before I end, before I forget, I wanted to remind my viewers my listeners my subscribers that i am an affiliate partner with vpn nordvpn and they're always doing special offers you guys they're always got something going on and they're offering a special deal if you just go and check out on their website the link is in the description box of my videos it's definitely worth signing up and getting protected protected with NordVPN. I'm also an affiliate partner with a Christian organization called Logos Bible Software and the link is also in my description box. Let me just show you their website here. What is Logos? Logos is a powerful Bible study platform that allows you to study scripture and consult commentaries, devotionals, Bible dictionaries and more, all from your computer, tablet or phone. With Logos 10, you get a theological library of curated books and tools recommended for in-depth Bible study. So if you're interested, again, go in the description of my video check the links go to the link open up the link and it will bring you to this page and you can have a look at what they've got to offer i believe that they are also bible study app okay what's new in logos 10 just go there and have a look, have a browse. Um, a lot of scholars and Bible teachers use this software. And um, I highly recommend it. So <laughs> without further ado, 
I want to end the video there and I want to thank you all for staying with me this far. How long has it been? Oh, only an hour and a half. Not that long. I will be back again soon, friends. It just took me a while getting things sorted. I had family visiting, a lot going on. And um, just some logistical things, friends. But I'm always keeping an eye on the news all the time. And I really encourage you to do the same. But more so, stay in the word of God. Stay in prayer. And um, keep your eyes peeled. Until next time, friends. Jesus Christ is Lord.